think what I want to mainly address are things like um, how we, what is the Raspberry Pi to start with, and also how does it compare with some of the other boards like Arduino and BeagleBone Black that are, are very popular at the moment, and then to look at a few example projects that use the Raspberry Pi and try and pick out what it is that, that makes a good Raspberry Pi project. The Raspberry Pi, um, you'll probably know this, or you're probably uh, may, you know, quite likely to actually have a Raspberry Pi, is a single board computer. Um, it's a, a Linux computer. It has half a gigabyte of memory, and it has, it, it's clocked. Its processor is clocked at 700 megahertz, but you can overclock it quite easily to a gigahertz. It's a useful little device, and it's sort of finding all sorts of different niches, and um, you know the, the overriding feature of it is it's low cost. Uh, these things are sort of um, 30 or 40 dollars, depending on which model you have. The Raspberry Pi also has GPIO pins, meaning that you can connect external electronics to it and then write programs that can interact with that. The Raspberry Pi, um, a bit of history about the Raspberry Pi, it was, um, it's a, a British product um, and it was developed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, um, who are a not-for-profit organization, and it's a spin-out from um, Cambridge University's computer lab. And the intention, really, of the device was to inspire children. And um, back in the 80s, there was a project in the UK uh, called the BBC Computer. And, and these computers went into pretty much every school in the country and encouraged a big sort of wave of technical expertise amongst kids. And an awful lot of kids, you know, myself included, uh, got to, you know, learned how to program or started programming with these computers. And it's really the same motivation that's inspired the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And so an awful lot of people who are buying these devices are educators, and they're using them in schools or their kids buying them. So they've got a little device that they can play with, learn to program with, learn to attach external electronics to, which is something that wasn't actually possible back with the BBC computer. When it comes to programming the Raspberry Pi, um, the language of choice is usually Python. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the motivation for the name Raspberry Pi is supposed to be uh, related to the fact that, that Python would be its primary programming language. And Python's not a bad choice. It's, um, it's an easy language to get started with. Uh, you can, it's interpreted so you can play with it in the interpreter without having to compile things and get into use, getting into using complicated IDEs is quite straightforward. Also good libraries, so if you're developing user interfaces, you can use TK Inter. Um, it's also got a games library that gives you sort of access to sprites, and you can create simple but colorful games using that. Um, there's other choices as well for programming. Um, Scratch, the, the MIT visual programming project, that's available for Raspberry Pi, and that is also getting used quite heavily uh, in an educational environment with the Raspberry Pi. And then for more heavyweight languages, um, we have this Java, uh, Closure, CL, which is a, a variant of Lisp, um, and Squeak, which is a type of small talk. Um, and if you want to, you can even put an, an entire uh, you know, uh, uh, LAMP stack on your, uh, on your Raspberry Pi, so you can have Linux, uh, Apache, MySQL, and Python, uh, and PHP, sorry, all running on this tiny little device. It won't perform massively well, but in, you know, in principle, you can do that. So I mentioned at the beginning that one of the things that make the Raspberry Pi interesting is that it has this GPIO connector. And this is circled up in the slide, in the, so it's up, up there on the top left of the Raspberry Pi. It has um, a number of different types of interface to electronics available there. It has um, one called I squared C, and you can get I squared C uh, displays and sensors and real time clocks and various other types of modules that you can connect to the um, I squared C pins on there. Um, it also has uh, TTL level serial connections, so you quite often find things like GPS modules will interface with that. And then you have general purpose I.O. pins, which are just digital pins that can either be inputs, and they can detect whether something is on or off. So you might want to connect a switch to them, and then when you flip the switch, you can tell that it's been flipped from your Python program or from whatever program you want to write on it. 
Um, and similarly, you can have um, out, you can make the pins act as outputs. So the pins are configurable. You can tell it to either be an input or an output. And if you're using it on, uh, by expansion, the GPIO connector up here in the top left um, has a number of different ways you can interact with it, and you can connect to external electronics. Uh, there's I squared C, which is a, an interface standard that is commonly used in quite a lot of displays, uh, you know, sort of LED displays. Um, things like real-time clocks often use that. Um, serial, which um, is used by devices like um, GPS hardware and sometimes um, barcode readers and things like that will have a serial interface on them. And then we have the general purpose I.O. pins uh, that can either be used as an input, a digital input, or um, a digital output. So if they're used as an input, you might connect a switch to them, and when you press the button on the switch, then you can detect that that's been pressed in your Python code. And for outputs, you might want to, say, connect an LED to the digital output so that you can control, maybe so you can turn lights on or off. Or you might want to use it to um, connect to other types of hardware, say a, a solid state relay that will actually turn some kind of um, uh, AC outlet equipment on and off, like a, a standard lamp or uh, lighting within the house. So the, um, as well as making use of, if you like, the individual pins, you can also get uh, expansion boards that just plug over the top of the entire GPIO connector. Uh, and a very popular one of these is called PyFace, um, and that's intended really as a, an educational board. So it has a couple of relays built into it. It has um, a little row of four push buttons built onto it and some LEDs. And you can experiment away with it and write simple programs, both in Python and in Scratch, just to get going with um, working out how to connect hardware to a Raspberry Pi and control electronics. It's funny how a simple thing like turning an LED on or off is just so much more interesting than the nicest graphical user interface in the world to kids. If you're playing with hardware, actually doing something that, that controls something physical that isn't just something showing up on a screen is, is, is very compelling. Um, another board uh, that's available that I've had a hand in developing is called the Raspberry Robot Board. Um, and this is intended, it, it's essentially a, a motor controller and it can control two DC motors or a, a single stepper motor. Um, and it has a few other interface options uh, made available on there as well. Um, it will also power the Raspberry Pi uh, through its own uh, voltage regulator. Another interesting board is the Pi Lite. This, this is a lot of fun. It's um, those little dots that you can see there. Um, it's the board on the bottom of the slide. Um, are LEDs. So I think it's something like um, 14 uh, columns of uh, 11 rows or something like that. But there's a lot of LEDs on this board. And um, it has its own microcontroller on there that communicates using serial with the Raspberry Pi, um, which means it, it actually a lot of the processing is devolved to this board rather than uh, acting, rather than the Raspberry Pi having to do everything. So it can just kind of send messages like um, display this text and it will put the scrolling text message up on this um, this board. People have done lots of interesting things with that, including a, a kind of obvious application for it, which would be uh, the game of life. So yeah, it's, um, there's other boards coming along as well all the time. Uh, there are boards for doing uh, interfaces to uh, radio frequency modules so that you can do wireless control and interact with wireless sensors and uh, things like that. A lot of people um, have asked me, what's the difference between a Pi and an Arduino? And they really are very different types of beasts. Um, I mean, the Raspberry Pi is a computer. You can plug keyboard and mouse and monitor and all sorts of things into it. Uh, and it, uh, and it, functions. it has Linux running on it and, it, and it functions just like a computer. You could put word processing software on it and, and use it as your main machine if you wanted to. <coughs> um, so, but the, um, the Arduino is a much, much simpler device. It has, um, it, it, it's basically most of an Arduino is just support electronics for doing things like regulating the voltage for a little microcontroller chip. Um, and this chip 
um, doesn't run an operating system, what happens is you install a program on it, and that program runs as soon as it resets. So you kind of burn a program into its flash memory, and that's what will run. There's no multi-scheduling. There's no um, large amounts of memory. In fact, you've just got two kilobytes of RAM to play with. Um, it keeps the uh, RAM use for variables and uh, data structures completely separate from the program memory, which is held in flash. And you can have 32 megabytes of flash program. Um, realistically, most of the programs you're likely to write with an Arduino are only going to be uh, you know, a few hundred lines of code at most. So you're, you're unlikely to ever exceed this limit. The Arduino is um, a much more rugged device as well than the, uh, than the um, uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, it's um, it's I/O pins uh, can cope with a lot more punishments. They're much more robust. If you short out an I/O pin on the Raspberry Pi, there's a good chance you'll damage your Raspberry Pi. There's actually a chance, good chance you'd damage it on the Arduino. But simply by just providing Giving, trying to draw too much from it on a Raspberry Pi, your limit is sort of 3 milliamps, whereas an Arduino's limit is something like 40 milliamps per input-output pin. Um, the Pi uh, runs Linux, which isn't a, a real-time operating system. And what I mean by that is that the Linux that's running on the Pi is, is doing lots of things at the same time. If you list its processes, you'll find you know, maybe dozens of processes running on it. And they're all competing for time from the processor. So that all the processor can do is kind of switch around and offer different, uh, you know, offer each of these different processes uh, some time. That means that if you're trying to generate accurate signals for something like pulse width modulation or for controlling servos, then it's a little bit difficult to do that. Um, Similarly, if you're trying to measure the duration of pulses and things like that, again, if you're washing and waiting for a, a, an input to change from being high to low, um, you don't know when you're going to be interrupted or what else is going to happen. So for tight control, where you are you know, coupling a load of electronics up to something and you just want to, say, measure, uh, you know, measure things with sensors and then control actuators, then the Arduino is a more suitable kind of device, really, in many ways. Um, it's also a much lower current device. It, can, it only uses 50 milliamps as opposed to the 500 milliamps that a, a Raspberry Pi could well use if it's got a few things plugged into it. Um, so it's, uh, the Arduino, it's really, I suppose, a case of horses for courses. For some things, you, you want to use an Arduino. For some things, you want to use a Raspberry Pi. And in actual fact, you can use the two together. You can have the Arduino talking uh, or a Raspberry Pi controlling the I.O. pins of an Arduino, and in many ways this is kind of the, the best of both worlds. Another board that's come along recently that, that's really interesting is the BeagleBone Black. Um, BeagleBone have, have been a, around for a while uh, with a, a variety of boards, and they've always been a little bit on the expensive side, particularly compared with Arduino, which was kind of what they were positioning themselves against. Um, with the advent of the Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone has kind of taken a step back and thought, you know what, we, we can see what Raspberry Pi can do. They can shift 2 million boards. I think we can probably shift more boards who've got a good product. So what they've done is produce the BeagleBone Black, which is a similar price point to a Raspberry Pi. Um, and in fact, it shares a lot of features in common with it. I mean, you could almost, I hesitate to say it, but you could almost call it an American Pi. Um, it's developed um, from uh, Texas, Texas Instruments, and it's just come out of their, uh, their business. So it's got very similar hardware to the Raspberry Pi, the BeagleBone Black. Similar process in RAM. It's the same sort of price. Um, the BeagleBone Black has um, built-in flash memory on it, whereas the Raspberry Pi, um, you have to put an SD card in with an operating system on. The BeagleBone Black, when you take it out of the box, it has a, a Linux. Uh, Armstrong Linux installed on it, and it will boot up in about 10 or 12 seconds into Armstrong Linux without you having to put any external cards in. It does also have a micro SD card, and you can boot it, boot an operating system from that if you want to. 
The BeagleBone Black also has a lot more GPIO and analog pins uh, than the Raspberry Pi. In fact, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have any analog pins. The Raspberry Pi will only do digital inputs and outputs, where the BeagleBone Beagle Bone Black will do analog um, inputs. When you look, uh, I mean, the, the thing with a, a product like this is it's not just about the hardware and the technical specs. It's also to do with the community and the resources that are available to you. So the Raspberry Pi, it's, it's got a bit of a head start. Um, it's really, it's an issue, you know, its inception was that it would be, at its inception, the idea was that it would be an educational tool. And also some hobbyists would use it, but primarily it would be for education and a cheap general purpose computer rather than being a computer for controlling electronics or a single board computer for controlling electronics. So it's kind of a vehicle for learning Python programming is the real sort of original motivation. Um, and as such, there's a big community of people who've been working with the Raspberry Pi and producing good educational resources so that it's easy to learn uh, to program it in Python or Scratch. Um, and there's also a very active forums and very active uh, community around the Raspberry Pi. I mean, even in the town I live in, in the, the northwest of England, we have um, the first Monday of every month, there's a, an event called the Raspberry Jam in the town where you typically get, well, 20 or 30 people who turn up for to show off what they've been doing with the Raspberry Pi or talk to other people who are using Raspberry Pi or um, listen to talks, that kind of thing. So it's a very active community, and similarly the forums are, are very active, so if you have problems trying to do something and you search for it on Raspberry Pi, you're pretty much certain to get find somebody who's come up across the same problem, and hopefully somebody else who's very helpfully provided a solution to the problem. The Beagle Burn Black is a much newer project, newer, newer product, so that community hasn't really yet had time to develop, um, and it's really, I think, aimed more at hobbyists and then education. The kind of the fact that you can use the BeagleBone Black perfectly well as a single board computer. You can plug a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse into it, and, and off you go. You can download, um, you know, a Word package, Abbey Word or something, and, and start um, using it as a general computer. It, it's almost incidental, really, to the to the message that you see when you look at the BeagleBone Black's website. It's really much aimed at hobbyists and people who want to use it as an embedded computer to control electronics. So the, in terms of um, software for these two platforms, um, with the Raspberry Pi, a huge number of software packages and Python libraries. Um, obviously, both run Linux, and in principle, most things should work on both without too much intervention. But in practice, there are always drivers that need rebuilding, and there are always things that need updating and uh, you know, uh, fixing so that they'll work with the little idiosyncrasies of the particular platform. Um, and as I said before, you, te you tend to program the Raspberry Pi in Python and Scratch. Um, Python is an extremely popular language, very well known, and Scratch is used a lot in, in education. The Beagle Learn Black, they take a slightly different approach, really, um, almost a brave approach, I I'd say, in that they've um, developed a, a library on, in JavaScript for controlling the BeagleBone Black's um, I/O pins, and generally just as a as the programming language for programming the BeagleBone Black. So this is um, server-side uh, JavaScript based on Node.js, um, and it does have some challenges explaining how to uh, do some things. So even kind of blinking an LED involves a little bit of a sort of paradigm shift when you start doing it in JavaScript with all these sort of with timers and callbacks and things. It's not quite as simple as just saying delay 100 milliseconds. But it's a very elegant uh, language and a very elegant approach. And I think once you've invested a little bit of effort in, in learning the, how this works, then it actually becomes quite a natural way of working. There's absolutely nothing to stop you programming the Beagle Bone Black and in uh, Python, and many people do. And there's a there's a good library for um, interacting with I/O using Python as well that's um, that's being developed. But kind of the sort of official message and the one that you see on the on the BeagleBone website is that Bone Script is the the way to develop.
develop it. So, as, um, as with the, Ar the Arduino, one of its big reasons for the Arduino success is the huge range of add-on shields that you can get. So you can plug things on top of the Arduino and do all sorts of um, clever things. Um, you can even make your own electrocardiogram as just a shield for everything, as they say. The hardware for add-ons for the Raspberry Pi, there, there are quite a few of these now. They, they, there are more and more being developed. Um, uh, hitting certain sort of niches, so some as an educational tool, some for controlling motors, some for various different types of display are available, and um, you know interfacing with uh, wireless technologies. Uh, and the um, same is true of Beagle Burn Black, but again, there's kind of a, a little bit of a, a, a gap really. There, there's a range of semi-official capes that are developed for the original Beagle Burn models. And not all of those work with the BeagleBone Black. Um, because they were developed with the original uh, range of BeagleBone boards, they are kind of expensive as well. So the hardware community that will, I'm sure, produce a huge number of interesting capes for using, to be used with the BeagleBone Black uh, is kind of in its infancy. It will come along, but it's a little way behind what's been happening with the Raspberry Pi. So let's have a look a little bit about um, projects that you can do, make with the Raspberry Pi. The beautiful thing about the Raspberry Pi is it's so cheap that you can use it for a single purpose. You can just put software on this general purpose computer, completely ignore the GPIO pins, just put some software on it, say to make it into a message board that you're going to put on the wall or um, an internet radio. And there's no reason why you shouldn't do that, because these things are at such low cost. Um, if you want to take a step further, then you can go right ahead and you can attach electronics to it. So you can use the GPIO connector and start fitting on switches. So you could, for example, make yourself a retro games console where you've got a, a proper old-fashioned uh, you know, uh, big red joystick that you can use to control the games. Um, and you can just build in all sorts of um, interesting little controls onto your uh, Raspberry Pi. This um, this example is one of my favourite examples with the with the Raspberry Pi. It's just very very elegant, really. Um, it's developed um, by Imperial College in London, and I think and if you just search on Google for Imperial College FM transmitter Raspberry Pi you'll find it without any trouble at all. Um, but what the project does is that it acts as a, a software radio. So you basically attach a short wire to one of the GPIO pins. I think it's GPIO pin 4. I might be wrong about that. Um, and then you run some software that they've developed. And that software makes the Raspberry Pi act as an FM transmitter. So you supply it with the name of a WAV file that you'd like it to play and they, they even provide um, the Star Wars theme as an example of this. And then when you run the program, it basically transmits that. So you, you can pick it up on an FM, an ordinary domestic FM receiver um, over a fairly large and probably illegal range. It's a very neat uh, little, little project. But I think the nice thing about it is it kind of makes use of everything that's already there. You know, it just, uh, it, it, just, it, it just uses one GPIO pin in a very neat way. Home automation is a, is a very good candidate for, for Raspberry Pi. And there are loads of projects on home automation. Um, the, the URL you see there is just one of these. And the, the general principle is, is the same, really. The Raspberry Pi, um, unlike something like an Arduino, comes with all with good network connectivity. So you can plug it, plug it into your local network, or you can attach a wireless adapter and uh, connect to it from Wi-Fi. And then you can have it serve some web pages for you. Um, and those web pages might be as simple as the example in here, where you've just got on-off switches that will control a number of light switches. And then that's all on the web page, so you can browse to that that's on a, a web server running on the Raspberry Pi. So you can connect that to that from any internet device. You can use your iPad or Android tablet or um, phone, whatever you like, to connect to that, and then click on buttons. And 
when actions happen, when you click on buttons or do something on the web page, then that causes um, the GPIO pins to toggle, perhaps, switching on a relay, turning a light on and off. Or you might have sensors connected to the Raspberry Pi that tell you the temperature in various parts of the house. Or you might have um, control over an electronic door lock so that you could unlock the door to your house to allow um, burglars in. All sorts of possibilities. Another one, um, another project I really like, is, is this one where somebody has taken an old uh, radio case. And it seems a bit sacrilegious, but apparently all the electronics were already gone from this box when he acquired it. So it hasn't been wantonly destroyed. But um, this lovely old uh, radio box has had its um, and it's replaced with a Raspberry Pi and a display. And it's um, internet streaming. It, uh, so it's acting as a, you know, you can stream music to it from your um, um, home uh, uh, entertainment center, that kind of thing. Um, but it keeps the nice appearance of the original device, more or less. The display looks a bit bright, but um, an e-paper display would be even better, but it's, 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 um, it still looks good. It looks in keeping. And then you have two knobs on there that you can use for volume and tuning. So you twiddle the tuning knob, and that's um, changing you, you, the source that you're using for the um, for the internet radio to, do, to um, play. Um, and the URL for that is on the bottom of there. If anyone wants to go and have a look, quite good instructions on how to do that. Another common project, another that people use, um, that people make with their Raspberry Pi is some kind of jukebox. And you can really go to town on the enclosure and um, fit it into something like the antique radio that you saw on, on the previous slide. Or you can just make a nice sort of, you know, a perfect box so you can see everything that's going on. Um, you can do things like, say, I just want a button that plays this tune. You can um, control all of it from your Python program. All you need to do is um, see which button has been pressed or write things to, uh, you know, and write things to a display to uh, tell the user what's happening. Um, another common uh, use and another nice use of the Raspberry Pi is to make yourself a, a retro gaming console. Um, you can use the GPIO pins to attach buttons and proper old-fashioned joysticks. And there are, uh, I think, two at least um, games emulator projects that have been ported to the Raspberry Pi so that they'll run um, NES and uh, all sorts of Atari and early games um, so that you can uh, step back in time and you can install these games onto your Raspberry Pi and have it boot up directly into the console so that you're, you're, you're just straight there without having to attach a keyboard and mouse and tell it to run a particular program. So this is a, a good, good use of the, of the Raspberry Pi. Because it makes use of one of the features that you couldn't do on something like an Arduino, and that, that is you can drive a big display. You can, it's got an HDMI output, so all you need is a, a flat screen monitor, uh, you know, underneath the table, uh, and then and, and away you go. This next project is um, one that uh, uh, I've developed. Um, it's. Uh, it just uses, it's just a little bit different in that it uses one of the Kronos watches. Um, and I'll just um, play you this video. What I'd like everybody to do, actually, I'm going to push out a URL to everyone. And then if you could just hold off pressing the play button until I say go, because I'm going to give a bit of a commentary on the, on the, uh, on the, on the video. OK, I'll just push that out. Now. So if you you should all see that um, URL on your screen. So if you load that up onto YouTube and then just pause it for a moment before we get going. Uh, so once it's once it's appeared, once you've got it on YouTube, just pause it for a second and then I'll explain what's going on as uh, as, we, as we're ready to go. Okay. So if you all press play now, what you see on the desktop here is um, a a Raspberry Pi with an interface board, and on my wrist here I've got a Kronos watch, which has got a built-in accelerometer and a built-in FM, uh, built-in radio transmitter, 
sort of communicate with the little radio receiver on the Raspberry Pi, well, actually on the, yeah, on the Raspberry Pi itself. So by moving my arm up like that, I can get mo both motors moving forward. If I tip my wrist to one side, it favors one of the motors a bit more, so that it steer that way, and if I tip my wrist the other way, it favors the other one. So it's just a, a little example of how you can drive, um, drive a little robot along using uh, one of these interesting watches. So let's just see a little bit more about this. So the Kronos watch, um, is this, I think they're about 60 or $70. Um, I'm, I'm not sure now. You can, you can certainly find them on Amazon.com. That uh, was the last place I saw one. Uh, they have built-in pressure sensors, uh, so atmospheric pressure, uh, ac accelerometers, and they have this FM, sorry, this RF transceiver, and a little dongle that goes with it, so that you can plug that into the USB port of a Raspberry Pi, or for that matter, any other computer, and then send uh, messages back and forth between the phone and the Raspberry Pi. It's actually programmable, but for a lot of applications, you don't need to program it because it has a mode where it will transmit its acceleration data. And if that's all you want from the device, then you can just use that, switch it into that mode without having to use the development kit that also comes with the Kronos. Um, and this other, the second dongle that we've got um, on the screen is actually a programming interface. So you take the watch apart, and then you plug the dongle into the circuit board of the watch and the other end into your USB port and you can upload new firmware onto the watch, uh, completely reprogram it to do something totally different. Um, yeah, so it has some um, built-in sensors, and you can also make use of the buttons on it so that you can detect button presses. You can send temperature data, acceleration data, or air pressure over to um, your computer or Raspberry Pi. So the way this is wired up on the Raspberry Pi in that little example project, is that um, we have um, the whole thing is powered by a battery pack because obviously we want it to be mobile. And the battery pack connects to the Raspberry Robot board, which has a voltage regulator, which will in turn power the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the Raspberry Robot board also has a, a motor driver that's connected to the two left and right motors, um, and the USB adapter, the receiver, as it were, for the Kronos watch, plugs into a USB socket on the Raspberry Pi. So um, just in summary then, the Raspberry Pi is cheap enough to use for a single purpose. It's, you can not feel guilty about taking it, putting it in a box, sealing the box up, and that's now your new appliance. You don't need to take it apart and then go and use the Raspberry Pi for something else. You just have to buy yourself another Raspberry Pi, I suppose. But it is it, that, that kind of flexibility means that you can use it for um, making things that are, that, that are just a single computer, just a, a computer in a box that does one thing rather than have to be a general purpose machine. Or you can take it a step further and attach your own electronics to it, even if it's just push buttons that just add a bit of, make it a bit more fun. Um, good projects for the Raspberry Pi are, are things that sort of make use of the features it has that something like an Arduino doesn't. So for example, um, it's very easy to add Wi-Fi to a Raspberry Pi, you buy a cheap $5 Wi-Fi adapter, plug it into one of the USB sockets, a little bit of configuration, and away you go. So the Raspberry Pi is great for projects where you want to uh, connect to the internet. Um, if you want to do fairly simple hardware interfacing, then again, that's fine. You can connect this up. Um, similarly, the monitor, being able to attach a monitor to a Raspberry Pi opens it up for all sorts of projects that you couldn't possibly do with, uh, with an Arduino, so you can uh, you know, have it uh, displaying, even if it's just displaying a slideshow hanging on the wall um, that you can then interact with with a web interface, for example, is, is um, very easy to do. Okay, um, I'd just like to mention, uh, I think as mentioned before, that um, I have a couple of um, books on the Raspberry Pi. Um, there's the Raspberry Pi cookbook which um, is out uh, in December. It's already available uh, electronically um, from the O'Reilly website. Anyway, if anybody would like to contact me, I'm on Twitter as SimonMonk2, um, and you can have a look at 
There's um, information about all my books on www.simonmonk.org. Um, and I also uh, write a blog on uh, www.drmonk.com, um, mostly about Raspberry Pi and Arduino and um, Beagle Bone Black experiments. And um, there's some, some useful information on there. OK. All right. uh, Yaz, do we want to go to questions now? Yes, we have quite a few questions here. Let's see here. So we'll start with Earl. Have you compared Raspberry Pi with a new Intel Galileo board? Um, I haven't got my hands on one of those yet. Um, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to trying that out. It does. It, it's an interesting looking board, um, so I can't really help you on that yet. All right. And then Matt wants to know um, from students, which do they seem to prefer, um, Arduino or Raspberry Pi? For students, did you say? That is correct. Yeah. Um, I think um, this is going to sound like a very sort of diplomatic answer, but I think both um, have their benefits in a sort of teaching uh, environment for students. I think um, I think probably the Raspberry Pi is, is a more it kind of starts off because it's more familiar to them because um, you are interacting it with it with a keyboard and mouse. Whereas the Arduino, you have got to do a bit of C programming before you can really do anything with it. Um, so I think probably the Arduino, there's a, a bit more sort of investment in learning how to use it before you can do anything particularly useful with it. But I mean, both give a good response, particularly, as I said, when you start um, connecting external electronics to it because I think people like to see things happening that aren't just um, on the screen, as it were. Uh, excellent. So um, Changa wants to know, Raspberry Pi has Raspbian OS. Is there a similar pre-built Linux OS for BBB? Yes. Um, it, it actually comes, it ships with Angstrom Linux already on it. Um, and it's um, it's designed to boot very quickly, um, primarily because people tend to use things the Beagle Bones in embedded systems. So you don't want to be waiting a minute for the thing to to finish booting up. So yeah, that, that that's what you get out of the box uh, with the Beagle Bone Black. And um, people are developing all sorts of other disk images that you can put on there. You, you can also put Android uh, on the Beagle Bone Black. All right. Um, and Bill wants to know, what are some the best forums for Raspberry Pi support? Um, I think the, the official Raspberry Pi forum, uh, which is, um, I don't have the URL handy, but I mean, certainly if you search for Raspberry Pi forum on Google, I think it will bring you up. Uh, that one pretty quickly. Also, if you just put your question in, um, you know, if you sort of say, uh, I can't get uh, such and such to work on Raspberry Pi, uh, it could probably take you straight to that forum anyway. Uh, you know, so, so search first, and then if there's nothing on there that, that helps you with your problem, then join the join the group and um, post your problem up there, and somebody else would quite like to come along and help you. All right, and Payush wants to know, um, he has to gift this to his brother who is relatively new to programming. Would you point him mm -hmm. to some resources and tell him about the necessary accessories which would make it easy for him to start? Right, okay. Well, you don't need very much to get started with the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's, uh, you, you, if you don't have access to another computer, or if his brother doesn't have access to another computer to create a, a, an SD card with a disk image, then you can buy a Raspberry Pi with a with a ready-made um, SD card that you can just plug in and it's ready to go. You need to have um, a monitor that takes HDMI input, which is a bit of a problem because a lot of the times monitors they'll have DVI and they'll have VGA, but they won't have HDMI if they're an older monitor. And so you kind of um, need to look out for a, a newer monitor. Um, you can get very cheap adapters that will solve the problem if the monitor is a DVI monitor. But if it's a, an old, really old-fashioned VGA monitor, then um, you can buy adapters for them. And you can buy very cheap adapters on the internet. On, but the very cheap adapters quite often don't work 
um, there's a, uh, there is a sort of certified adapter that does work um, that's available um, from NCM uh, Electronics and CPC and I think probably quite a few other places, but it's quite expensive. It's sort of, I think something like $30, which seems a lot when the Raspberry Pi itself is so cheap. Um, and apart from that, you can use absolutely standard USB keyboard and mouse. Um, I think it's, I tend to use a wireless one. I get a, you know, one of these that has a combined, has a single dongle that will then attach to a wireless keyboard and mouse pair. Um, it just means that quite a lot of time you don't need to get a hub because you can just, if you've got a Raspberry Pi Model B, it's got two USB ports and you can just plug everything uh, you need into that. Um, in terms of sort of resources, if, if it's primarily for learning to program uh, and he wants to learn to program Python, then it would be remiss of me not to recommend my own book, um, uh, Programming the Raspberry Pi. Um, but if, you, if he's not really interested in the controlling electronics aspects of it, then any book on, on learning Python would be just fine. Uh, and there's, there's some very good uh, getting started guides to Python out there. And indeed, a lot of sort of uh, tutorials that you can find on the internet that will help you get going with that. Excellent. We just have one more question here. Um, Ahmed wants to know, you had mentioned that both the RPI and the BBB have similar processors. Does this mean that both mm. would have the same support for a multi-threaded server type software such as Erlang? Um, well, they're, they're both of the processors are single core. So um, uh, I, I think Erlang, if I remember rightly, is this a, a multitask? Uh, is this a language that's designed to work across multiple processors, or am I getting that confused with another language? I'm not sure. Anyway, I mean to summarise, they they're ARM processors um, that both are around the, the gigahertz sort of clock uh, range, and they're both single core uh, devices. All right, and then I'm just having a couple people say that um, they're getting DNS fail errors when they try to go to your site. Um, I personally am not having any problem, but do you know what that might be, Simon? Oh, okay. Um, it may be that they have to put um, www in front of both of those URLs. I, th I have some strange DNS thing going on. Um, I've, I've had that reported before, generally from certain countries. I've no particular idea why that should be, because it always works well, okay, for me, and um, tends to work okay in the states. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But if it, I know sometimes I'm not sure. At least one of those URLs I think doesn't work unless you put the www in front of the um, dot Simon Monk or the dot Doctor Monk. Okay, excellent. I pushed those out to the audience, so hopefully they work for everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, and that's pretty much it for the webcast. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to leave the audience before we go today? Not really, other than I hope they enjoy having fun with it.